At this moment, the South American Institute of Government and Health, a center for strategic thought within UNASUR, starts the online transmission of the conference Challenges for Universal Health Systems on the 21st Century, which will be given by the Professor Emeritus of Yale University and expert in health policy studies, Theodore Marmor. The conference will be presented in English with simultaneous translation to Spanish and Portuguese. To choose the language, just click on the link located on the transmission window on the hot site tedmarmor.isags-unasur.org. After Professor Marmor's exposition, there will be a debate with the present audience composed by experts in the area, representatives for the ministries of health of the 12 members counties of UNASUR, and the participants that watching us live on the internet. You can send your questions and comments to our email address, to our Twitter account, and to our Facebook page that are in the screen. This is the fifth time Isaac disseminates knowledge and debates important issues with the online live transmission. This tool strengthens the Institute's mission of promoting the exchange, the critical reflection, knowledge management, and the generation of innovation in the field of health policies and governance. We'd like to thank the press that is here today, Newspaper Globo, and Doc Magazine, and organizations that supported us by divulging the conference. PTP of Suriname, UNASUR General Secretariat Communication, PAHO, Alames, Horas com RU, Abrasco, SEBS, ENSP Report, Education Network of Health Technicians, RETS, Fiocruz Polytechnic School of Health, Salud Derecho, a World Bank Initiative, Ibero-American Observatory of Policies and Health System, and Foro de Salud Pública do Equador, to name a few. ISAG's even being a young organism, which completed two years of existence last July, has been performing its three main functions, knowledge management and production, development of leaderships and technical advisory. Through its short, short tra trajectory, it has already hosted 13 workshops and edited two books. The first one is called the Health System in South America, challenge to the universality, integrality, and equity. The second one was dedicated to health surveillance of South America. They are both available in Spanish and English on our website's library. Next, we, have, we are having a debate with the participation of the audience, which will be moderated by Isaac's consultant and technician of Brazil's Institute for Applied Economy Research, Professor Carlos Occhi. Professor Marmor, is an international reference in health policy studies. Has over 200 articles and 13 books published. Among them, The Politics of Medicare and Politics, Health and Healthcare, written with Rudolf Klein, besides many essays in major newspapers such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. From 1992 to 2003, he, has, he was the director of the postdoctoral program in health policies at the Robert Johnson Foundation, the biggest philanthropic institution of the United States, dedicated to health care and health service. He has a PhD from Harvard University and participates in the blog Bill of Health from the university's law school. After the presentation, we are having a debate with the participation of the audience, which will be moderated by Isaac's consultant, Professor Carlos Ock. I now invite the Professor Emeritus of AU University, Theodore, Marmor to present his conference. Thanks for coming, Professor. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. And thank you, Dr. Temporal, and your organization for <clears throat> asking me to come to this very interesting gathering of people from all over South America. It's a privilege to be here. It's not a privilege for you that I speak in English, but I hope that the translation will work, and I hope you'll keep me alert 
if the speed of my remarks goes too fast. And I'll ask you particularly to do that for me. Um, <clears throat> the approach I want to take to participating and contributing to this gathering is I want to try to summarize what I take to be the most important lessons I've learned from 40 years of working in the health reform sector, doing research in the United States in two different areas, one north and south between the United States and Canada since the 1970s, and secondly, between North America and Western Europe. So I don't come here as an expert in South America. That should be clear. I don't, I'm not playing that role. But I do have those decades of experience in trying to understand what has happened in those countries, to describe that accurately, to understand why it's the case, and then to ask the question that's crucial to all policymakers, what can I learn from that experience that will be useful in my own circumstances? That's the background to the material that I'm going to discuss today. And I'm going to do it in four parts. Um, the first part will be a summary of what I take to be sensible ways of thinking about doing cross-national policy research in the world of health care and in the world of health. And I'm distinguishing those two, or the world of health care and the world of public health. One way of thinking about this topic is I want to explain why in an article that I wrote relatively recently, I talked about the promise and the perils of cross-national policy research. I want to explain that. The next topic I want to make, uh, the subject of my remarks, are those comments about so-called models of healthcare reform, particularly models of how to do universal healthcare, and arguably models that are about not only that, but about doing it in a common system of healthcare financing rather than a, a separated system of many different parts. The difference between common benefit, common uh, administration, and dispersed administration. And I know in Brazil that that's an issue of concern between universal systems and a common healthcare system for everybody in the population, if I've got that right. The third is very briefly, I want to talk about what modes of analysis one can use in making sense, in explaining the variety of healthcare systems we actually observe in the world. The ones that I'm going to be talking about will include the few that I've mentioned already about, as well as the work I've done with secondary reading. And then lastly, I want to do something for which you may be a little surprised, but I hope have some interest. I want to take something that I wasn't asked to do and instead close by trying to describe and explain what President Obama's health care reform is about. Not because I think you need to know for Peru or for Venezuela or for wherever else, but because it's a very interesting test case of some of the claims I'm going to make. Fair enough, so four topics. I know you're imprisoned in these seats for a long while. You tell me whether the imprisonment becomes unbearable and I'll stop uh, for a second. All right. One way to think about this topic of what are the rules of the game of doing comparative policy research in the world of healthcare. Just think about your, the five fingers on a hand. And I'll go through five different approaches, two of which I don't recommend, and three of which I distinguish and do recommend for different purposes. OK? Ready? One, the two that I would not urge you 
to employ, and I would urge you to be skeptical about whenever you see them employed. Uh, and I'll start with the seemingly, perhaps I should get a little bit farther away. Is that right? Would that be good? The seemingly um, innocent form, which says, I go to the experience of other countries because I want to find the best arrangement in the world. And I'm assuming when I do that, that what I find, I'll be able to do in my world. I call that the fallacy of naive transplantation, because it is never the case that you can go to another place, grab the arrangements that they do. There are parts of medical care that you can do. Uh, removal of appendix can be the same sort of operation, but not an arrangement for financing, delivering, and regulating medical care, for reasons that I'll elaborate later on. The other extreme to what I call naive transplantation, uh, the idea that you can translate it in a way that will be exactly the case in part in site two as it was in site one. It's clear enough for that? The opposite of that is a kind of intellectual nihilism uh, or counter-intellectual thought. And it's interesting to be aware of it. it. It's proven to be quite important as an element of argument in many of the debates that I've been in in North America and Western Europe. And the counter argument is the following. The initial premise is, if there's any respect in which two countries are dissimilar or not alike, there's no respect in which they can learn from one another. The next premise is, there's always at least one respect in which two countries are different. There, by, by syllogistic logic, there's no respect in which one country can learn from another country. And let me give you an example of that at work. When I was writing about Canadian national health insurance in the 1990s, um, a colleague and I published an article in the New York Times talking about lessons from Canada for the United States. Canada had started its national health insurance system some decades before President Clinton was uh, suggesting his. And a doctor from White Plains, New York, wrote to the New York Times and stated, how could Professor Marmore and Professor uh, Godfrey ever come to the conclusion that there was anything to learn from Canada for the United States? Why, he said? Well, it's the case that 90% of Canadian population is located within 100 miles of the north-south border between the United States. You see the logic? Since that's true, nothing is possible to be learned. You, it comes up in many different forms, but I assure you that, that both of these fallacies can be found in debates. So leaving those aside, let me turn to the three that are different but have their own purpose and merits for them. And I'm going to start with the one that's usually given the least attention. One reason to engage in cross-national investigation is to understand yourself better. Travel writers everywhere know this the case. Because when you go elsewhere, whether it's to a place very different from your own or quite similar. When it's very different, things stand in bold relief, the differences between the sharp, sharpness in which a problem is defined in site A from the way it is defined in your place. Interventions look in, in the most similar system designs, more nuanced in differences. So either because of nuanced differences or large-scale differences, the mirror on yourself is a source of illumination. And I would call this form of cross-national search illumination without transplantation. I'm hoping that this combination between useful and allegedly useless will be useful. Um, the second, and notice about the first effort 
to get illumination but not necessarily transplantation of policy losses. Notice that I didn't distinguish whether you go to a place very similar to your country or places that are very dissimilar to your country because there's different insights that follow from both. But let me turn to the, to the second of the useful ways. Uh, and that is when you're thinking about projecting forward how a problem might be defined in the future or how options for addressing that problem might be defined in the future or trying to estimate the effects of a proposal that other people have acted upon and you've not. The design that makes sense under those circumstances is what you would call a most similar system design. The closer the countries you look at are to your country, the easier it is as a natural experiment to balance against extrapolation, theoretical models extrapolation, and your own historical experience. It's not that it's a substitute for those, it's a complement for those and a check on forgetting that the past is that what was in the past and the future is different or all the other ways in which you need to check your projections. So most similar system design is a, is a defense in part against explanatory, um, I, su I suppose I would say explanatory provincialism again. If you're only looking at your own experience, you're not seeing common experiences. And so that's the second one that I re would recommend. And finally, there's the design in cross-national research of what you would call the most different system design, in which the virtue is the more differences across the set of countries that you look at, the more you look for any commonality across many different systems, and I'll give you an example uh, of that. Where you find commonality across different social, economic, and political systems, the argument is that you found something very important that's likely to affect you. If it has capacity to overwhelm the differences across country, why do you think you're so different from those countries in which the common element emerges? Now let me give you an example of that. Years ago, I was investigating the question of how physicians are played in public health insurance schemes. And a study of many different systems suggested the finding, this was before American Medicare was put into place, suggested the following, that there is a diversity of the ways in which doctors are paid across public insurance systems, but there's a uniformity between the way they were paid before the public insurance system and then the way they were paid in the public insurance system. In other words, there's a uniform relationship between what the doctors were used to and what they were, how they eventually were paid, even though many reform groups had very strong feelings about changing those methods. But the politics of doctors' pay disputes had a uniform relationship, and I used that basis of research for encouraging my, my leaders uh, in Medicare to take that into account and not believe and when the United States enacted Medicare in 1965, there was any chance whatsoever of transforming the fee-for-service medical care payment arrangements that dominated the earlier period. Clear enough? That's, an, that's a concrete example. If you can't do what you wish to do directly, that leads you to a concerns about indirect ways to affect the factors at hand, rather than the belief that you've got the authority across all of the schemes. Interestingly enough, if you now do an investigation of methods of paying doctors all over the world, what I think survives as the best generalization for it is that mixed systems are everywhere. That mixed systems that use for different purposes, salary, capitation, and fee-for-service, emerge in the bargaining with physicians as governments seek ways to constrain the outlays and the bargaining takes place, all right? So that, those are the preliminaries that I would suggest are worth keeping in mind whenever you're thinking 
about public policy making in any policy area, but including the health care area. Um, and if you are doing that, if you are spreading your intellectual wings or spreading your scope of investigation, both to similar systems and to very different systems, I would just add that any policy program in operation emerges from an interplay, I would argue, of at least three basic elements. One is the ideas in play in your society in the course of acting on a reform proposal. What's current? What's believed to be um, au courant or lively and in play? Second, the material and professional interests of the providers of medical care with whom any public program of financing has to bargain. Those are going to be constraints on what it is that's possible to do. And the third, and the one I least know well in this context, is the institutional structure in which the decisions about what to do and how it's to be financed will be bargained out. And the reason I bring in this, what I call the three I's, ideas, institutions, and interests, the reason I bring it in is those are dimensions of similarity or dissimilarity as you do the cross national research. And I'll employ that in some of the things I'm going to be talking about uh, now. I'd like now, if I can, to become more concrete. Uh, and to discuss in detail some of the country experiences that I've uh, done with others research on. And I suppose to, you should, at, you should uh, be expected to want to know what countries have we concentrated on. I mentioned at the very outset, for me, it's been North America, Canada, United States with special emphasis, but it's been Western Europe and North America. And we, the source of most of my commentary now emerges from 10 years of annual conferences of a week of between 40 and 50 policy analysts, policy makers, and journalists uh, from Germany and Holland, Canada and the United States, and the U <coughs> England uh, and Australia. Those were the six we concentrated in for 10 years and produced a book in 2009 uh, on that subject. And I'll draw from those um, experiences examples that I think bear directly on your concerns here in Brazil and elsewhere in South America about the role of private health insurance and public health insurance private health financing and public health financing, uh, and what comparative experience might, might bear on how that might be useful to keep in mind. I want to begin by saying that the, the most striking feature of those 10 years in discussions of private health insurance in connection with public financing programs, the most striking conclusion was that the basic logic of private health insurance is different from the logic of public financing of medical care. It's not that you can't regulate or try to regulate private health insurance. It's that you're regulating them in ways, if you want to mirror the values to be served by a universal and comprehensive single program, to get private health insurance to serve those ends means that you challenge some fundamental orientation of those private health insurers. How do I, why do I say that? Well, either social insurance or public ins health insurance begins with objectives about making health care either affordable to the population or not costly to the population when ill. That is, the idea is producing a marriage between the injured or sick person and medical care providers and not having financial barriers between those two. 
because if there are financial barriers, we know it follows that care will be allocated with respect to ability to pay and willingness to pay and not with respect to seriousness of medical need. That's a premise of this argument. But private health insurance doesn't begin with those premises. Private health insurance begins with the premise that I have to set a premium such that the expected costs of that care to that person will be covered by that person and the group in which that person is operating. So that we also know, and they also know in private health insurance, that in any modern medical care system, 5% of the population in any one year account for at least 50% or near 50% of the outlays for it, or 10% in North America account for 90%. Well, if that's true, there's no form of efficiency in private health insurance that can make up for making mistakes of having too many people in the high spending area. So risk selection is at the base of private health insurance. You can argue that it should not be, that there should be community rating, but you're going against their logic. It's like pushing water uphill. Um, you, you, you get some of it, but not very much of it, and there's leakage all around. That's premise number one of the observations. And I think it's worth keeping that in mind and then asking, is there evidence from the operation of healthcare systems around the world that support that proposition? And the answer is there is. Um, there are health insurance firms in the United States, for example, in California, that have all of their their supplementary policies for our Medicare program for older citizens in America uh, in affluent suburbs in which people have to walk up five flights of stairs in order to get to the person to sign up the insurance. That's a form of risk selection. That separates out the, 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 the well and the healthy from the less well and the less healthy. So point number one is that the logic of private health insurance, while it can be the subject of regulation, goes against the grain. And I'm not saying that's a matter of personal conduct, evil. That's a matter of the financial incentives driving private health insurance and their practices and their known ways of doing business. A second illustration that I'd like to call your attention to is the growth in many, many policy debate contexts um, of what sometimes is called a pro-market conception of how to think about medical care in its proper reform. And that so-called pro-market conception says there's no reason to believe that medical care is all that different from other goods and services. And if it's not all that different from other goods and services, there's no reason why ordinary market allocation should take place. People should have, and the expression in English, and I'm interested in whether the same expression is in Spanish or Portuguese, is patients have to have skin in the game in order for a medical care system to operate. That theory, which is often followed up by the use of the claim if medical care, if, if bread were free, no bakery would have any bread left by the end of the day. Uh, notice what's going on here. It's a, it's a presumption that you can talk about people when they're sick, injured, or fearful as if they were buying bread or buying shoes in which their tastes make a big difference rather than the premise of both social insurance and classic examples of national health insurance, as in the Canadian case, where the idea is exactly the opposite. The idea is to make it possible to get access to medical care so that the providers of medical care can spend their time with what they take to be, with their knowledge, the most important things to do. Clear enough so far, the illustrations? What I want to assert 
rather than defend at great length, is that the two ideas I just was talking about, the one that ordinary market economics uh, should apply in medical care, and two, that private health insurance is geared to a market allocation of its, its services. Those claims are often called in the political analysis business neoliberal approaches to medical care, distribution, financing, and regulation. And I think that's true, and that gets me to, a, to emphasize one of the three I's I talked about, which is one of the important questions about how things will work out in any country or any particular policy is whether those ideas that I've just called neoliberal are dominant or on the defensive. If they're dominant, there's going to be a clash between the conceptions of social insurance or the conception of a common benefit program, precisely because the neoliberal cast of mind says you should have as many variations as their people. People ought to be able to choose the medical care that they want to be covered, leaving aside that the one thing you can't know for sure is what your medical circumstances will be like, exactly the opposite uh, of other areas. And let me now give you an example, another concrete empirical example, of how far these ideas have moved in recent decades. And I want to use as my example the developments that took place in Switzerland in 1996 uh, and in the Netherlands uh, in 2006. In both cases, both the Netherlands and Switzerland, those countries took a step to universal financing of medical care by mandate, by requiring that everybody in the country, a citizen in the country, open to receiving benefits, will commit themselves, will be forced to, required to, at punishment, um, if they don't get medical care insurance. Interestingly, the background to that, as you may know, is that in the Switzerland, there was a relatively small proportion of the population that was without uh, insurance from either work or, or various social insurance arrangements or private insurance. In Holland, the situation was a little different and interesting. In the period before 2006, 99% of Dutch citizens had health insurance, all but 1%. And yet, the government of the day decided, and, and, the, and the background regulations were, if your annual income fell with the, within the 60th percentile of incomes in the country, you were required to have social insurance, to participate at work in social insurance. If not, the remaining 40% were free to get whatever insurance coverage uh, they want. In Germany, the figure was 10%. Interestingly enough, 99% of Dutch citizens had health insurance at the time of this change in 2006. Does that strike you as puzzling? Having insurance is an important cultural norm in Holland, is what that illustrates. Fascinatingly, because the arrangements for making it possible for people to buy the, the insurance that they're required to have and otherwise pay fines, there's a system of subsidies that are used in the Netherlands. And these subsidies are supposed to be adjusted each month, a different monthly subsidy towards the health insurance, varying with the income of the person in the family. Well, guess what happened in the wake of the 2006 reform? Let me report to you two major findings. First, within the first year, the rate of non-insurance in Holland tripled from 1% to 3%, even though there was a mandate. And the explanation is that people's lives um, are complicated lives, particularly people having trouble with work and other arrangements. And they fell behind in their payments or didn't pay at all 
and the insurance companies who were selling this insurance were throwing them off the insurance. As a result of that, a private deal had to be made between the government and the insurers not to throw so many people off and to keep the subsidies at levels which couldn't be justified but would protect the government from the embarrassment of having caused a tripling of that. And the second thing that happened over the first six months is that this policy which was meant to be justified by its capacity to control the rate of inflation in medical care expenditures and prices, there was an increase in the rate of increase of medical inflation from about 8% to 12% in the first year of operation. So on, ne on neither ground, either on the cost controlling ground nor on the simplification ground, were any reasonable objectives met. But you would never know this from the celebration of competitive health and private health insurance that finds its way into the journals. It's the great untold story. It's backed up in part about Switzerland's experience with, with uh, inflation as well. Now Holland and Switzerland have moved up in the expenditure tables uh, and are spending near the top of the OECD uh, coverage. So I use those as examples of what cautions to keep in mind um, about the reported experiences uh, of others in, uh, others in the United You can't, another way of putting the same point would be to ask the audience here, how many of you knew about the Swiss and Dutch experience over the past decades or so? Not at all. Can you imagine how easily you could be victimized by a salesman for these two? Think of this as a general practitioner, Professor Marmore, coming to try to vaccinate you uh, against uh, the disease of false claims. And I suppose I should take off from that last point and emphasize once again um, the importance of accurate description of the experiences of other countries as a prerequisite for intelligent lesson drawing from those countries. This may seem the most obvious thing in the world, but it is not easy to understand the workings of any one medical care system, as all of you know from your own. So that has an implication, particularly for your think tank, doctor. Um, and that is where cross-national research is on the agenda as desirable, I would say on the basis of my experience that the best form of it is collaboration among national experts to share a common set of questions but to provide an uncommon set of answers from people whose experience is very great for the countries that you're being talked about rather than trying to locate all the research at one site in either one or two researchers, but rather collaborative research among experts to deal with what I call the very serious problem of knowing what's true before you're able to draw lessons from it. In fact, I think at the end of 10 years, our group final session, one conclusion was we were astounded at how much we were surprised by what we learned about the experiences of other countries from national experts that we would have not have known had we not employed this cooperative research uh, agenda. Let me make a couple of remarks about regulation and then turn to the surprise story which is Obamacare in Brazil, for whatever purpose it can serve, uh, of changing the subject matter from what you might have expected. I know that there's a special interest here right now in improving the capacity for regulatory intervention. Uh, within the healthcare sector, but particularly with respect to private health insurance. And what I want to just take note of is two 
quite different conceptions of what it is what one refers to when you talk about regulation. One mode of thinking about regulation identifies it with a separate organization devoted to regulatory authority over a sphere or an industry in which there's independence between the programs that actually finance medical care and the programs that investigate the regulatory compliance of doctors, hospitals, and health insurers between so regu regulatory, separate regulatory authorities and the regulation of the sector as distinct from financing the care in the sector. The distinction I would draw is between that on the one hand and the rules and regulations that accompany the actual financing of medical care. There's a set of regulations there, but you don't, they don't mean the same thing. Regulatory authority may be very much supported by financial capacity to follow up in a way that external and independent regulatory authorities are not necessarily as well equipped to use financial sticks and carrots. Uh, so that distinction, I think, is helpful, too. So let me turn to why I believe that if you knew a bit more about the Obama reform experience, it might have some bearings on it as you think about the design of policy interventions in your own countries or studying the policy interventions across countries of the group that's here uh, for this workshop. I would start by saying that the, the, the most fundamental and accurate point to make about American medical care is that it is a patchwork of different arrangements for medical care financing and delivery and regulation. It's not one system. Many people think it is, but it's not. And let me enumerate the five patchwork elements and the theories underneath them that give them justification as a, as a beginning point. Patch number one, I, I will call America's, the United States form of socialized medicine, in which the government owns both the means of producing and delivering health care and finances it. Ownership and finance, which is the normal conventional meaning of socialized medicine. And that group is American veterans, which has a hospital system and a medical care arrangement uh, tied to American teaching hospitals all over the country. It's got, a it's got nursing homes all over the country. And the theory of entitlement is interesting to reflect upon. The entitlement theory is that those who have sacrificed for the country as a whole especially those who've been wounded or disabled in the course of serving in the, in the military. They deserve from the citizens of the United States um, free medical care for the rest of their lives, um, or nearly free. That's the theory of entitlement. The society has an obligation in the light of the sacrifices for the society to take medical care outside the family medical economy and provide them that kind of medical care as a matter of right for the rest of their lives. That's number one. America, American medicine number two is our version of social health insurance. It's as if Medicare is part A, the 60 days of hospital care in which the financing is while people were working, a 1.45% levy on their wages and their employers part of their wages, exactly the form of contributory social insurance that you will recognize here in Brazil and elsewhere in Latin America. The theory of entitlement is if you did your part by contributing to the pool, you deserve our care when you become ill or injured. It's a common benefit that links all those who share that participation. It doesn't distinguish by means or assets. In short, it is social insurance transferred to the United States as if it came from a social insurance sickness fund uh, in Belgium or, uh, or Germany or in uh, 
column. Thirdly, so we have the VA, we have Medicare Part A, and the third institutional arrangement is a mirror image of what is associated with, with the poor law. Tests of both assets and income. It's called Medicaid, 50 different state administrations of a common set of basic, basic benefits that is paid for at very low levels of compensation and produces very great barriers to care. Not financial barriers to care, but service barriers to care, that is the unwillingness to take those benefits. But the theory of entitlement underneath that program is the theory that if people are in bad enough shape financially and medically, we owe it to the people who've suffered, uh, either our charitable impulses or are not wanting to see the effects of it, either the, uh, a more genial or a less genial conception of why that's the case. That's, that's the third. Number four is private health insurance largely connected to work. Employment-related health insurance, 175 million of 320 million Americans get their insurance through, through that form. It's subsidized by tax treatment. It, a dollar of subsidy uh, for that insurance does not count as a dollar of income. Um, and over time, sit, work, workers increasingly get the kind of coverage that their employers are willing to buy for them. So for all the talk about freedom of choice of caregiver, the fact is that employment-related insurance narrows the choices to a degree that would be unrecognizable in the Medicare program. And finally, and you may know this already, we have in the United States an emergency room national program called EMTALA. Uh, anybody who goes to the emergency room in any hospital in the United States that is registered with the other programs I've just talked about will lose its license if it dumps that person uh, into another hospital without sta stabilizing them. So what's the theory of entitlement? The theory there is if you're the victim of an accident and your life is at risk, we, the citizens, owe you access to an emergency room, no matter what else there is about your, uh, your financing arrangements and your insurance. Clear enough, if, is the patches clear to you, the five patches? Now, what did President Obama decide strategically to do in 2008 and 2009? He decided three things. One, he decided that the composition of the Congress, both when he was running for the presidency and what he anticipated would be the composition of the Congress when he became president, he believed, on the basis of President Clinton's experience, that the Congress likely to be in power would never expand the Medicare program either to all or to most, or to even drop the age of eligibility from 65, say, to 55 or 50. So his view was, since he wanted to make a big change in the coverage of citizens, and felt he could not make that change according to an incremental expansion of the most favored of the five modes, of the Medicare one. Instead, what he did was decide that he could patch each element up of the five and add to the coverage of Americans by increasing participation in, in as many of those five as he could. You probably know that he was facing a situation in which at any one day, 50 million Americans out of 320 million would be without insurance. And even more important, something like 90 million Americans over a two year period would experience a time when they did not have insurance. And since we were spending $8,000 per capita for medical care, it would not take long in hospital care or surgical care for families to be ruined, which is the purpose of social health insurance to avoid. So what did he do? He made deals with the drug industry, 
to not go after bargaining for lower prices of drugs. He made a deal with the private health insurance industry that if they stopped arguing against what he was for, he would expand their, their participation in American health care by requiring, by mandating, that Americans without health insurance would have to have health insurance, and that those would be made financially more possible by subsidies which would be developed by the Internal Revenue Service, our tax authorities. Um, he also embraced three ideas about cost control, none of which would control the costs of medical care. Now, he spoke about cost control, but not very convincingly. He thought, number one, that he made prevention uh, more attractive in health insurance by requiring that the, no deductibles or coinsurance for it, that it, infla inflation uh, would not result, and prevention would cause fewer practices, fewer activities to be engaged in. Second, he believed that electronic medical records would have a big impact on the cost of medical care. And thirdly, he believed that if we knew better what worked in medical care, so-called comparative effectiveness research, that, that would make a big difference. Well, I think it's fair to say that the comparative evidence doesn't support any of those three ideas about cost control whatsoever. Um, and I suppose it would be fair to say that President Obama got as much of what he asked for as anybody could have dreamed. But to notice about that, that what he did was give up what he preferred as the right way to do it, which would have been a Medicare expansion, and instead took his model from his opponents. The very plan that I'm talking about, the Obamacare plan, was actually designed by conservative economists in the Heritage Foundation in the 1980s. So it was a bad deal politically. He got no support. He only got support by the Democrats. He did, got no political capital increase from that. And the, the Republicans have spent the last four years criticizing him for doing something they, they themselves have promoted. I don't know how useful it has been to review this, but I hope it's been useful to show you the power of ideas, in this case, on the part of conservatives who are holding out the prospect of, <coughs> of the, the, the Obama plan without taking credit for it, but influential. I hope you see examples of importing ideas about what could control costs that turned out not to be the case. And in general, I hope, despite the fact that I'm in no way expert about Brazil or the rest of Latin America's arrangement, that talking about the experience of the OECD countries, as I have, will have been helpful for you. Carlos? We will now start the debate and receive questions from participants of the workshop and from those watching us on the internet. You can send your comments and questions to our, our email address, to our Twitter account, and to our Facebook page that are in the screen. Questions? We have some here. Well, the first question from Peru, Professor Marmor. In the past, the proposal of managed competition oriented some reform experience in South America. In global terms, what's your evaluation of this proposal nowadays? The question is about the managed competition. I heard the, I heard the question. Can you hear me? Sure. Well, the first thing I would say that my, the expression managed competition is an oxymoron. Um, and by oxymoron, I mean meaningless. You don't manage competition. You regulate competition, well or poorly, 
and you manage resources well or poorly. And when Alan Intovin collapsed that expression into one, he fools as many people as he can fool all of the time. That is, suggesting that competition among insurance firms with rules will produce outcomes that, for which he cannot give you the evidence except in very unusual circumstances, as, for example, with special groupings of doctors and hospitals in the Kaiser Permanente scheme in California or uh, group health in, in uh, Minnesota. Because what, uh, this is part of a more general problem of the language we use. And I suppose it would help, uh, Carlos, and you stop me if I go on too long with this okay. question. Um, both in Switzerland and in Holland, there are those who would describe what they did, the mandated insurance arrangement, as managed competition. But since there's not managing the competition, but regulating the conduct of the health insurers, there is something to restraining the restraining role that the regulations play in the private health insurers doing what they would like to do otherwise. There's, they can't refuse access to insurance, so there's, they, they can't rescind the insurance. All of those are the necessary regulations of having private health insurance play a role at all. Now, whether or not the inflation experience in both uh, Holland and Switzerland provides any support for the, co the co claim that reductions in insurance expenditures followed from the regulated competition uh, that, that was enacted, I don't think you can find the evidence for it. Um, so my, my generalization would be that the language itself is misleading. And let me make you another example of it to make this more comprehensible. Notice the following trick, that if I say my company back in New York, is a managed care company. Or that my insurer is an integrated delivery system. Okay? Notice about this way of talking that I'm defining the label for my company, for my insurer, in such a way that I'm praising it by definition. It's, it's what's called in the philosophy of language persuasive definitions. And a persuasive definition is one is as soon as you know what the defini is, definition is, you're persuaded to believe there's something positive about it. How can you see that? Well, imagine words down one column, integrated delivery system, managed care, and so on. And then at the far to your right over here are examples of the opposite of that word. So managed care, the opposite or the antonym, is unmanaged care. How many of you for unmanaged care to give him by doctors? None of you. There's nobody who celebrates unmanaged care. But that tells you the word managed care is misleading. It's saying that the care that you're talking about is by definition managed. That's why you called it so. How do I know it's so? Because I just said so. It's a circle. Same thing with integrated delivery systems. Is Peru in favor of disintegrated delivery systems? No, of course not. Uh, and notice another trick being played. I, I really am trying to be a general practitioner uh, with language vaccination. Watch what happens when I turn the description of this company as to a company involved in the management of medical care. That's what it's. That's what, that's what its occupational uh, area is. That's the industry that it's in, the management of, of medical care. Notice I haven't said anything that suggests to you that it's good, well-managed, or poorly managed. Uh, equally, uh, when I say I'm interested in coordinated care, my company's a care coordination company, has it told you how it is that care is going to be coordinated? No. So there's a part of this is the language of marketing, which I think has come with the expansion 
of, of idealizing business management in the last three or four decades, which is part of the spread of the neoliberal ideas I was talking about. But it's a spread through linguistic conventions rather than argument and evidence. Thank you, Professor Tedder. Please, those who want to make some sentence sent to Hanat and Beatrice, they are sitting here in the front line. Uh, I'm going to read more three questions, Professor Marmor. Uh, we received a lot of questions from Bolivia, Chile, Brazil. Uh, the first question from you're gonna, you're Professor Noronha. Three at once? Yes, if you don't mind. From Professor Noronha, you could write down. From Alamis, Brazil, he's asking, will Obamacare survive current Congress compositions? What's your opinion? Another question from Professor Machado from the National School of Public Health here in Brazil, asking you, by your experience, which are the most successful strategies to involve doctors to attract them to support a public and universal system. And the last one uh, from Bolivia, why does the Canadian experience inspire you, your approach? Don't the American analysts health policies that criticize the markets admire the English example, trying to compare English case and Canadian case? Please, Professor Marlon. Go on. So, have I? Okay. It works? Okay. If I understand the question correctly, I, at least one member of the audience is really interested in what's going to happen to the Obama plan. Is that right? Okay. Well, I, I don't know how many others are, but I will give you the best uh, <laughs> guesstimate that I can give you. First, on the question of whether this large scale but disappointing uh, piece of legislation that had a very difficult uh, implementation, as you probably have read, and still of the 50 million Americans which constituted the non-insurance, something on the order of eight to 10 million have been covered after almost four years. Um, that's, you, you cannot, that's in, in some respects a disappointing experience for some people who thought that nothing was possible they will find some virtue in that experience. But what you will find for sure is complexity in the actual implementation of it. Having said that, there's no chance that the legislation as a whole will be wiped away. And the reason for that is institutional, one of the three I's. As I was. Because of the veto system of the, of the United States federal government, the president can can stop a piece of legislation, and in order to get it over his saying no, vetoing, you need a two-thirds vote uh, of the Congress to go over it. And that's too high um, a barrier to actually get, even with diminished Democratic support in the Senate, in the House of Representatives. So I suppose the way to put it is that American Political institutions generally disperse political authority. They spread political authority among the judiciary, among the executive, and among the two houses of the Congress. That both makes change hard to produce because of the many points which you can stop it. But ironically, what led Obama to adopt a plan he wasn't necessarily all that excited by was his thinking that it would allow him to get over these veto points. And ironically enough, it's going to stop a complete overhaul or repeal. Instead, what's going to happen is there are going to be continued weakening of the institutional arrangements for moving this incrementally. And at least, if I can draw a conclusion from it, which I think is relevant to your any of your considerations of the analysis of a reform proposal. One question 
that you can ask at any one moment about a reform proposal would be, what's the, what's the form of this proposal that I politically can get accepted, given my institutional and circumstances and the power of my coalition that I've got? What's the most? And I think that's what Obama thought he was doing with the, Ob the ACA. And the, and the defense of a judgment like that would be, do you agree with me that this is the most I could have gotten? And let's say, that's accurate. It was the most. It doesn't follow from that, that that course of action was the best course of action. It might be the most you can get, but not the best you can get. And why do I, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to give you whatever fruit there is of 40 years of being in this business. The best option at time T is what the option will look like three, five, ten years ahead. And the trajectory of a less grand option at time T compared to a bigger option at time T depends in part of your projections of what it will be like as a takeoff point for further implementation. And because of it being a patch on a patchwork, patches on patchwork are very hard to administer and leave lots of boundary problems, as we're now experiencing. And social insurance, by contrast, is relatively simpler to, to use as an instrument. And therefore, if the president had asked my opinion, I would have said, expand the Medicare program to age 55 and change the tax treatment of excessive payments. Is that? Does that capture your? All right, so that's my effort to, to answer the Obamacare question. You are attending us across the internet. Feel free to send your questions. Let's make another question, Professor no, no, Marlowe. I want to go to two and three. Okay. Except I can't read my writing. So. Uh, Let's, let, let's go on, and afterwards you can reply. You don't okay? have Not anymore. Okay. In your opinion, how we could attract the physicians to support the public health systems in general? That's not an easy question to answer, but one part of, of any answer, in my opinion, would be by sharply distinguishing between two things in dealing with professional leaders in the medical profession. One is to distinguish between the leadership that medical, outstanding medical personnel can play a role in deciding what should be covered and how it should be covered in judgments about, about the medical care autonomy of, of medicine and the scope of intervention on the parts of doctors. But that's what to do, not how much they're paid to do what they want to do. So the sharpness that, the sharp line that I would draw between appeals made to what I take to be deep interest of physician leaders in professional autonomy about education, about the decisions about what works in practice. Um, and that set of concerns m means a lot to those leaders. That's their calling. And it's separable. It's not completely independent of the material interests of professionals. But I think part of the danger of listening too much to health economists who have been schooled in market economics is the belief that the most important thing to professionals uh, is their income, rather than that there's a trade-off between income and autonomy and that they care. And this, I would think, you can see working out over the last four decades in the Canadian context um, very much, where in each Canadian province, there's two medical organizations. One is called the College of Physicians, something like that, and the other is the Organization of Medical Doctors. The latter are there for bargaining with the government 
about fees and about the financing terms, the, the medical, the College of Physicians is there to work with the government in setting rules for medical education and professional conduct. I think there's a lot to be learned by paying attention to that. And finally, I would say that I think the complexity of living with the mix of private and public, and particularly the going back and forth, will prove to be extraordinarily complex for people over time, particularly if it expands in the proportion of the population that does so. When you've got parallel systems that are separate, then there are lots of rules to keep them separate. If you have systems which people go back and forth, you've got to worry about things like delays in the public side in order to generate less delays on the f financial side. There's no escaping, in other words, in the mix of private insurance and public insurance without the complexity which is costly and complex for people to live with. Costly financially and complex to administer. Okay. Uh, another question, Professor Marmor. Uh, Nilda from Ecuador. Professor Marmor, what's the role of fees regulated in Medicare in the relation with health providers? What's the role of the, the fees to regulate? Well, that's an example of the one type of regulation that's different from a regulatory authority. Uh, the, the rules of that game are part of bargaining that takes place between payers and professionals. And I would say um, the most crucial lesson to draw from the history of disputes about fees is that the incomes of physicians and the incomes of other medical care providers, let's start with the income of physicians in a fee-for-service scheme, it's the number of activities they engage in times their average price. That's what their income is. So any discussion of fee schedules is really a discussion in part of what incomes physicians will earn in the subsequent period. And there's no avoiding it. There's no, there's no way, or it's, maybe I can make the analogy to my own experience dealing with deans of, of units at the universities where I have never met a dean in my life who paid me what I was worth. Um, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> but I've never met a dean who told me what to do either. In other words, I have, in my professional life, experienced the trade-off between financial autonomy and professional autonomy. Um, I also think that there's a danger, I don't know whether this is a danger in discussions here or in rest of Latin America, I'd be interested in finding out. But one of the illusions in the United States is that you can make fee discussions technical. You can make them semi-automatic, find out some facts and adjust automatically the fee schedule. And it's just not plausible account of the realities of, of modern physicians' life. The changes in technology mean that there are big changes in the resources that go, particularly the time resources, that go into certain activities, whether of diagnosis or of interventions. And that has got to be put to common testing between those who are going to receive incomes and those who are going to provide incomes. And I think it's very important to be candid about that just the way I was candid with you about no, no dean paying me what I was worth. Is that? That's, my, that's the way yes, I would answer yes. that one. I apologize for not reading all the questions. I, I have been receiving a lot of questions here from Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, Paraguay. So let's have two more questions, Professor Marmor. The first one, please, from... Argentina, Mariano Fernandes, what are the most effective policies to avoid the increase of price of the private health insurance? Uh, once again, the best policy to avoid uh, high price in the dynamic of the private health insurance market. 
and the second one in another direction from Professor Siliansky from Brazil. How are at present the public support to public universal health system in the US? In terms of the social subjects who fight for? Where, what's the role of the social movements in this direction? I, as I understand the first question, it's a pretty straightforward one. What can governments do that can affect the prices and volume of private health insurance? The only way it can do something about that is if it engages in something called all-payer rate regulation. That is, if it uses public authority to enforce restraints on the pricing and behavior of private health insurers. Um, it can't do so by any magic. It's got to use its authority, its power, to set rules which are directed towards avoiding behavior that there's political consensus should be avoided. It's not, there's no magic bullet here at all. And that's one of the most important things to say, is that there's no magic, magic bullet. Um, I suppose if you're asking me to give you an example of that happening uh, in a public medical care system, I mean, in a medical care system that I'm familiar with, I would say that for much of the period 1970 to 1995, in the state of Maryland, in the United States, an all-rate review uh, commission produced reductions in the rate of increase of hospital costs per capita that were really quite stunning and were quite controversial. Um, I think it's also fair to say that the insofar as private health insurers are worried about the price of their premiums, which is not quite fees, but their premiums. Another direction they can take is to increase the cost sharing paid by the people who are under their system. That dilutes the coverage, but keeps prices seemingly under control. But the spillover effects of that is another way of denying access to care and redistributing income from whatever would be the case. So nothing, nothing more than premium reduction has the, has the danger of that being the spillover consequence. By the way, I'm going to hold in reserve saying something about Canada, because I know somebody was interested in Canada. And I think I'll have something towards the end to say. But maybe I'll hold that for my last, when we get close to the end of this unusual format that we're engaging in with people watching this from other places in Brazil whom I can't see and have no connection to. I can, ah, there's the camera. I can look and say, hi there. Greetings from, from Rio. Social support for public health. First, let me make a qualification about what we're talking about. Notice that you can define public health in two different ways. One is you can say those arrangements that affect the health of the public, one of which is the financing of medical care. But you can also call public health those threats to the health of the population for which individual medical care is not the answer. And unless you're clear about which of those you're using, you're going to have a hard time being clear about what the conversation says. There is fear about public health in the classic public health sense, particularly illustrated by the panic about Ebola in the United States. Um, that may be connected as well to the, the mixed coverage of medical care services, the fear that what would happen if one were in a hospital being treated for Ebola with quarantine and the extraordinary expenses that if you were uninsured that you would face. So there might be, but it doesn't spill over directly into support for medical care financing and delivery. And here, 
Here I'd like to make an analytical point that I might have made earlier on. I, and this will be relevant when I talk about the Canadian case or the British case or any of the Western European cases. There are two quite separate justifications for comprehensive universal health financing of medical care. One is a strong belief that medical care and access to it, that medical care is for people who are frightened, injured, ill, or worried about it. Medical care for them is best understood as a merit good, not a market good. That's the core belief under the National Health Service in England from 1948 on. It's the core argument underneath the universal coverage of the Dutch system. It's the core belief in the Medicare program in Canada of both doctors and hospital, doctors insurance and hospitals insurance. Um, and the, the way to express the principle of a merit good is to say that a merit good should be distributed according to ability to benefit and the seriousness of the problem, both. And a market good ought to be distributed or allocated on the basis of ability and willingness to pay. Now, clarity about those distinctions helps to explain why Canadian Medicare is the most popular program in Canadian life. And anybody who tried to get rid of it would be in deep political trouble. There's, they might try to weaken it, but anybody trying to, to do it in a particular province uh, will have great difficulty. Now, I bring that up to distinguish that from the case of, for classic public health measures, which is the problem of, of contagion, the external consequences of your not participating in the restraint of the behavior in question. Now, there's, there's issues of liberty of, of conduct that are raised by that. But I'm trying to avoid the collapsing of the two programs. And I would say that contrary to what many people believe, something on the order of two-thirds of Americans express support for the five principles of the Canada Health Act. You, you don't ask them about Canada. You ask them to describe the patchwork that I described and then describe the Canadian principles, and two-thirds of Americans opt for the Canadian principle, and something like three-quarters of the Canadians opt for the Canadian principle. So when you do it neutrally, as opposed to exposed to those other means, you get a result which says that most, but not all Americans, 25 Americans think they're living on ranches in Texas, uh, and they're not, there's a libertarian strain, which is there in every society. But broad support, not nearly as passionate as Canada and the UK. But that's partly because we don't have experience with it as Canada and the United States. But as a barrier, no. We are receiving a lot of questions concerning the public and private relationship, especially from the internet. I'm going to ask you some of them. Actually, both two. The first one, Professor Ted, is, are there successful experience of introduction of the private sector in the health systems where the principles of equity, solidarity, and universality were not affected? Are there experiences in which those factors were not affected? Yes. Yes, I were not at least transformed. And I think a fair, it would be a fair statement to make that both in the Netherlands and in Switzerland, fundamental elements of solidarity between those who are higher in the income distribution and those who are lower in the income distribution, a considerable amount of that was retained through regulation. But it was retained through regulation by regulators who had had decades of experience in doing that regulation. And what you have to watch out for is the 
basic logic of private insurance taking over in systems in which there's not experience with the many techniques that would be actually used. It isn't um, as egalitarian, I think, as it would be in the Canadian context, but yes, I do think you can, with experienced regulators and consensus on the value of solidarity and the value of protecting protections against ability to pay as the major factor, it's possible but difficult. What I'm most concerned about is making sure you know that it's difficult, not that it's impossible. In the same line, what have been the most successful laws in the European countries and in Canada in the sense of limiting or minimizing the effects of inequality created by the private sector in the health system? Well, I. As I said, the three that I just re remarked are, are three reasonably good cases of protection of solidarity. But I, I would emphasize even more, and maybe now is the time I should bring in the Canadian case. One of the important features of Canada is that the citizenry actually is pretty much kept up to date about what rules Canadian health administrators employ in their running their system. So let me, let me just reiterate for you the five principles of the Canada Health Act, which uh, from 1984, which has been the basis for all constitutional challenges to the Canada Health Act. And I'm going to give you a particular example which would make Canada uh, considerably more um, egalitarian than most other regimes. The five principles are that the Canada Medicare program, insurance, should be available to all citizens of Canada everywhere. So universal coverage of a common health insurance arrangement is to be taken for granted as number one. Number two, that the financing of that health financing, the sources of funding, of that health financing shall be fair in its distributive impact on Canadian citizens. That means two things. That there should be general use of taxes that can be justified as reasonably fair by the provinces who administer this scheme. And interestingly enough, that it's been interpreted to mean that no financial barriers to care are permissible. Not deductibles, not co-payments, not co-insurance. That it's funded by taxes and premiums um, with roughly speaking, on average, 30 to 40 percent of it coming from the country treasury as a whole by giving back tax capacity, and the rest coming by a, a, a range of taxes, all of which have proven acceptable uh, in each province. So that's the second, fair financing. The third is that the coverage of your province shall be portable all across Canada. So that no matter where you are, you've got stable coverage. And that there will be, there'll be undertakings uh, and contracts to permit this to be acted upon by these provincial administrators. The fourth element is that the care that is covered shall be comprehensive in the sense that it will have no special exclusions. Uh, it's what doctors, will what doctors groups will find acceptable as covering basic medical care. Um, and there can't be uh, related to that. And interestingly enough, pay close attention. It is impermissible to buy private insurance for care that's publicly financed in Canadian provinces. This ban expresses an extraordinary commitment to the merit good idea, because what it prevents is the request for topping up so that you get to jump the queue. It expresses the view that what's wrong with you is the basis for medical judgment, not what the size of your wallet is, if you want to use that kind 
a metaphor. Well, the reason I want to emphasize this is that Canadians were not rabid egalitarians in the 1950s and 1960s when this was first done. This, was, this conception of health care was sold, was, pers was persuasively presented by political leaders that built up a constituency for it as fair. And the fifth principle, by the way, is that there be a clear line of political authority to an accountable public official so that they, the program can be held to account. It has to give an account as well as being held to account. So I'm, I'm really introducing my Canadian point here by suggesting to you that the lesson I would draw from the Canadian case is that the value commitment was both a predecessor to the enactment and a reinforcer over time of the deepening of support for it. And it seems to me there's an important lesson there too. Professor Marmor, from now on, let's, let's try to talk about uh, other issues. So there are two questions here, very important. The first one from Enan Hamus from Peru. How citizenship participation and the articulation between governments can affect or interfere on the implementation of health reforms? The second one... No, no, before you go to the second one, give me the, the noun in the beginning of that sentence. Hernan Ramos. No, not the, the name, name, but the noun. The, the, fir the first part of the question. How does what? How, how citizenship participation and the articulation between governments can affect or interfere on the implementation of health reform. Well, I suppose there are two different conceptions of citizenship participating. One would be whether there's a social movement to ask for, to demand changes in the medical care system in the first place. My last answer tells you something about that. I'm really calling, saying that something like a social movement is an important aspect to bringing a conception of medical reform that encourages a merit good view. It's not going to come just from elites. Um, it has to be acceptable to broad groups within the population and particularly to people who are passionate about that. But I don't believe that the social movement aspect is what's crucial in the implementation of, legis of reform legislation. There, it's cooperation between the government and the implementation parties in which there's accountability for doing what it is that you said you were going to do. Um, and citizen, another way of putting it, I suppose, is, is this. Ordinary citizens are busy people with family and work. Governments, doctors, hospital nurses, active, active participants in the medical care industry. It's their work to figure out how to deal with, with the barriers to this. And you can't count on persistent mobilization of citizen participation. What you can count on is the citizen attention to reports of what's going on in the implementation without thinking they're day-to-day -day the most active participants in that process. I think it's asking a lot uh, of ordinary citizens to believe that they're in the streets most of the time monitoring that scheme. Walter Zoros, he's working in the network of National Cancer Institute of UNASUR, Brazil. He would like to ask you, the cancer burden is rising fast all over the world. The cancer. The cancer burden. Uh, cancer. 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 Sorry, Professor. Uh, cancer is it's like a concert. <laughs> the, the current health care model is not and will not be able to deliver care and treat all the people who need this treatment. How do you see 
how do you see this is the big challenge for all health systems, including those in the developed countries, to face this problem? All right, if I understand this question properly, it's cancer um, is growing as a uh, cause of death, um, and aging is taking place in lots of societies. Question, can cancer care keep up with the aging and the increase in cancer incidence? Prevalence. I'm going to approach answering, I'm going to approach my trying to give an answer to this question first with a qualification, which is that I'm an expert in neither in cancer nor particularly in aging, although more in aging than in cancer. Um, the first positive point I would make is that too many people believe in my judgment, that aging of societies is some kind of demographic destiny that has controlled our world, and they're making a mistake. And let me give support to that and the importance of other factors. And I'll actually turn again to what I know by heart, my Canadian-US comparisons. In 1970, Canada and the United States spent exactly the same proportion of national income as the other did, 7.1, 7.0% of GDP. In 1990, Canada spent about 8% of GDP. The United States spent 9.5. By 1990, the United States was spending 11.5, and, and Canada was spending about 9%. By 2000, uh, the United States was spending 14, 13 to 14 percent, and Canada was spending between 9 and 10 percent. And by 2010, the figures were close to 17, 18 percent in the United States, and about 10 in Canada. In other words, a huge gulf had grown up between the two systems. Now, I want, I want you to give me the benefit of the doubt, or trust me when I'm going to say that the medical care arrangements in Canada and the United States are as similar as any two systems could be. Voluntary hospitals, fee-for-service payment of doctors, formerly nonprofit and for-profit insurance companies, and the coming together of doctors and hospital insurance, but not, for example, pharmaceutical insurance everywhere. A another crucial link in my argument for my conclusion is if I tell you, and you have to believe me, is that it, from 1970 to 2010, the United States and Canada aged identically. The same proportion of increase each year took place in North America. Huge differences took place in the financing of care. Aging is not the reason for that taking place. That's the argument that I'm making, and it's an important one because the cliché that de demography is destiny is a cliche that, like all cliches, seems plausible enough if enough people are saying it. It, it takes the form of a repeated slogan. And let me give you another example of evidence that bears uh, uh, on this. If de demography was so much the destiny of a country that experienced aging, we would have seen in 1980 to 2000, in Northern Europe, Germany, Holland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, we would have seen dramatic transformations of the medical care system. Because it was in that period that the aging took place that the United States is not going to experience until beyond 2020 uh, as a proportion of the population. There was a 50% increase in the proportion over age 65. So for these reasons, and I could go on, but somebody's looking at their watch, and I know I don't, I have no idea how long this television program goes on. We have some more questions well, I, I, I from the internet. You, you, is, are there any regulatory authorities on the, the limits of questions? Uh, Carlos, let me stop for just a second and get enough water to, sure. to, to take water care of here. my dry... The first question 
it's uh, a very important question nowadays. Once the private health insurance market and the market in health is, is, is getting stronger, the first one is, what is the main business in the health sector? What is the most lucrative one? Are there difference on this respect between European and South American countries, or is the same? The last part of that question presumes my having more knowledge of South America than I do. And it would be a bad thing for somebody who thinks he has expertise in some areas to lose that authority by being cavalier about that difference. It's, it, but I have to say again, there's two very different questions being loaded together into the business question. To ask what business you're in can lead you to answer, I'm in the healthcare delivery business, I'm in the business of, of research on healthcare, I'm in the business of biomedical research. That's my occupational activity. It's not what provides the largest gap between costs and revenues. The, co the, the gap between costs and revenues, if you're a nonprofit, is called um, reserves. If you're a for-profit, it's called profit. Uh, and you can, it asks fundamentally the same question, which is, what produces the largest gap between the expenses you face and the revenues you're able to raise? Um, and I don't have any idea um, what the comparative experience is in Latin America. In but let, let me put in other words, uh, presenting this question here from the internet. Maybe it's, uh, it's more clear. What's the real degree of influence of the economic groups in the international financial markets in the elaboration of the health policies? There are some, some constraints regarding that or not. So in the United States, for instance, just in case, when you think about the Obamacare process, what are the influence of the market lobbies in make some veto or to defeat Obama proposal. So how, how can you see that in the world in general? Well, for, as a political scientist, what I would say is pay attention to the material interests and their willingness to use their fiscal and their fiscal powers to affect democratic elections, to affect lobbying, uh, of legislators to reward people with all kinds of funds. Um, and the pharmaceutical industry would be an example of the very, very powerful exercise of those capacities. Um, but I would, I would caution thinking you're ever going to get away from that influence. There's no way in which the material interests of the participants who make medical care possible can be taken away. It has to be confronted and countervailed, not taken away. You have to think about it as a struggle uh, in which, understandably enough, both the pharmaceutical industry, the hospital industry, the health insurance industry regard revenues over costs as their incomes. Um, and asking them to, to be innocent of that fact uh, is a sure sign that you're going to be disappointed. Um, and I suppose that leads me to, to say what kind of countervailing force is likely to be more effective. And let me here distinguish between two ways by which lobbies can add to their incomes. One is by getting public programs to pay them more for whatever it is that they're delivering, uh, whether it's drugs or it's um, equipment uh, or it's health insurance premiums. Um, and in the case of health insurance premiums, it would be what various citizen groups are prepared to pay or what's left for them to pay when the public uh, 
is available or not available at all, available in a limited way. So the, what are the two consequences of pressures from lobbies on that? One consequence is that the public sector, acting as a consumer's cooperative, really, on behalf of citizens, uses its countervailing power to bargain with those actors about what is plausible, defensible, affordable, um, and what will cause them trouble uh, in their own political circumstances. So in one case, it's revenues. In the other case, it's political support. A second way in which lobby groups can demand more authority and, and more influence over what's paid for their the goods and services is if more pressure is put on citizens for out-of-pocket expenses. In other words, as you thin out, as you make the, the insurance coverage less effective in dealing with the economic consequences of being ill, people are put into positions where they have to find resources that they thought they didn't have to find with more generous insurance policies. So leakage in the insurance policies is another avenue to increased revenues. There will be some decreases too, but will be less than powerful cuts or diminutions in the rate of increase in fees and bargaining. So the, the, the content of the bargains is a little more complicated than just simply what it is that public bargainers will be able to get in the way of regulations on premiums or in the way of regulations on fees and hospital costs. Another question is about the U.S. health system, Professor Marmor, from Professor Ivo, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, Brazil. Some health policy experts project 20% of GDP regarding the health care expenditures in 2000. 22 in the U.S. Is this sustainable, feasible? Can, so that, that, that's the question. Well, that's the question. I'm going to wait until I get some more water to answer the question. <laughs> and I'll claim, I'll claim medical necessity as the, uh, as the justification. All right, <clears throat> that's the kind of question I get in every talk I give in the United States. Uh, <laughs> and I have 10 minutes left, uh, is what I understand. And I'm coming close to, the, to a reasonable end to my capacity to answer any more questions. So I'll take this very seriously, this question. First, if there is no collective authority that chooses what the budget for medical care shall be at time T plus 1 and T plus 2 and T plus 3 and 4 and 5, then it follows that it's possible that the United States will spend 20% of GDP uh, in the next uh, five years, uh, six years. Um, I should say that in 1990 uh, and 1991, when the Clinton proposal was most actively pursued, the Congressional Budget Office made four different estimates of what medical care expenditures would be in 2000 as opposed to 1990, and they were wrong uh, all four times. Um, so futurology particularly by people with linear minds, um, is not an exact science, for sure, about medical care. But it's a most inexact sci science if you're starting with a country that makes no effort in the first place to put a boundary around the expenditures. So a necessary condition, in my view, for getting medical care costs within some kind of affordable budget a reasonable budget, is having the capacity to create a budget ex ante, not ex post, um, 
and to enforce it. That's true in England, it's true in Canada, it's true throughout the Western European countries. It doesn't tell you what the bargaining will produce, but it tells you what the parties are bargaining about. We have no such institution in the United States. There are a lot, Medicare does not have a budget. Medicare discovers its budget. Uh, Medicaid does not have a budget. It discovers its budget. Um, private health insurance has expected revenues, but it's not a budget that other people face. It's that they participate in. So that's point one. Point two, there's something comical about asking whether this out, set of outlays predicted is sustainable. There's a famous quote by a very clever policy analyst in the United States named Herb Stein. And he said, and I hope this translates well, if a particular program's budget is not sustainable in the longer term, it won't be sustained. So asking the question in that way presumes some kind of capacity to stop, which isn't present in the United States at all. So it, it, is, um, it is an ironic formulation, but ironically enough, it is a window on to the problems of American medical care. I should also add to that that this is another danger in public misunderstanding about inflation in the first place. Um, the relevant rate of, an, of inflation and medical care costs are in relationship to what changes in American income. That it's the relationship to, to the pace at which incomes rise and the rate at which per capita expenditures rise. And when the rate of growth in the United States fell as sharply as it did in the post-financial crisis area, so did the rate of increase of medical care per capita expenditures. But the ratio remained roughly the same, roughly two to one. So that if inflation was at 2% and medical care expenditures per capita were rising at 4%, the ratio was still two to one. And a two to one ratio will have a big impact on overall expenditures over time. Is that clear enough to the audience? I apologize again for not reading all the questions sent by the internet and by this audience. And I believe we have had a very enriching debate and I would, would kindly ask our lecturer to make his final considerations on this issue in a few words, please. <laughs> I've been speaking now for almost an hour and 50 minutes. Um, I don't know what the few words would be that I would come up with. But I suppose if I were to summarize what I hope to communicate today, perhaps that would be the most useful thing to do, is that I hope I communicated an, the seriousness of my argument that before you engage in cross-national policy analysis, you should take seriously the reason you're doing it and take seriously an appropriate judgment but what you can reasonably expect to get. That is, there should be attention made and paid to the method, me method and purpose, um, whether it's tra transplantation or um, natural experiments, or it's looking for powerful cross-national generalizations. The second thing I hope you've taken away is that the language of medical care to the extent that it's come to embody the sloganeering and illusions of marketing approaches to persuading people is an enemy of clear thought. Um, I, I, I didn't mention it, but I should mention that I published a book of essays a few years ago called Fads, Fallacies, and Foolishness in Medical Care Management and Policy. And much of what I tried to say to you today arose in, in the us essays in that book, and I hope that got through, that I was talking about the danger to coherent thought of faddish thinking, of fallacious thinking, 
and then certainly a foolish thinking. And my last part, I suppose I would say, I didn't do this very clearly, but I would urge you to get to know something about the different experiences of the countries I've talked about. There's a literature there, and particularly on the Canadian uh, case, I think it would, be, it would be valuable for you to understand the relatively simple and clear commitments that are there. Uh, and Carlos will tell you how to get a hold of the book uh, that, that is there. Uh, you can, you are, some of you already know about um, why some people are healthy and others not, the social determinants of uh, population health, or chapter eight, will bring up the Canadian case. Uh, but you can find it easily enough, and if I say anything more, my voice will actually disappear. So thank you very much for being an attentive audience. Thank you. On behalf of Aizagis, I would like to thank, once again, Professor Ted Marmor for his exposition. On the next two days, we will continue with the workshop Strengthening the State, Regulating the Market, Challenges for UNASUR National Health System, with the participation of representatives for the Ministries of Health of the 12 South American na nations. We thank all of you who have watched us and sent your questions. The, the videos of this conference and of the other presentations will soon be available on our website at www.isags/unasur.org. Thank you very much.